Hi everybody, today we're in P5JS and what you see here is rectangle packing on a Perlin noise field. There's a link to the code in the video description and you don't need to know any code just to play with this in your browser. I got inspired to make this from Matthew Hughes's wonderful pieces on Twitter. His stuff is better than mine. I will leave a link to his Twitter account in the video description. Before I get into the code, be sure to leave a like if you thought this was cool. This is part one of a two-part video. In this video, I'll go over rectangle packing, including rotation of the rectangles and using Perl and noise to control that rotation. And I'll only talk about the color briefly. In part two, I'll go over a second way I rotate the rectangles and go over the color in more depth. Let's talk first about rectangle packing or trying to fit as many rectangles as you can into the space. And we'll start with no rotation of the rectangles and not using Perl and noise. There are different ways to pack rectangles, but the way I'm doing it is this. First, pick a spot on the canvas and a width and a height for the rectangle. And for that rectangle, we need to know if it will fit in that space. So we'll trace the outline of the rectangle. And for each spot along the edge, we're going to get the color that's currently on the canvas. We could look at every pixel, but we don't have to. We could skip some of the pixels. We'll still get a good check, but we'll be reducing our processing. And we might want to do a second tracing a little bit bigger if we want to make sure that there's a certain gap between each rectangle. If we do that and find that the same color is at all of those spots, then we can place the rectangle. If any of those spots is a different color, then we can't fit the rectangle there and we move on to a new random rectangle. So in this simple example, I'm tracing each rectangle. So here I've got some variables, x1, y1, the height, the width, a gap, and the amount that I'm going to be skipping. Right now I've got angle set to zero, and in draw I'm calling this check rectangle function, uh, which is sending x, y, h, w, and angle. So then if I go to the check rectangle function, it's receiving all of that, and then it's drawing the sides. And so this is the top side. Let me comment out everything else, and we'll just check the rectangle once. So the center of the rectangle is down here, and what we're going to be checking first is the top left corner, and then working our way over to the right. So we start at x1, y1, we subtract half of the width and half of the height. For this line, the y stays the same, but the x increases. So you've got the y defined here, and then the x in a for loop, the y2 is y1 minus h divided by 2, and the x2 starts at x1 minus width divided by 2, and it continues on until it gets to x1 plus width divided by 2, and we're going to add a little bit extra with one skip, and then we're incrementing by our skip amount. And then I'm calling this rotate point function, and for right now, the rotate point function is just making a point at the end. So we'll get the rotation in a minute. So then the next set of points is the bottom. And it's exactly the same thing for the x, but the y is just slightly different. Instead of minus height divided by 2, we're adding height divided by 2. Then we'll draw the left side, uncomment this. So this one is similar to this, except it's just flipped. So the x2 remains the same on the left-hand side, while the y2 starts at the y1 minus the height divided by 2 and continues on until you get to y1 plus height divided by 2. And then the final side is exactly the same as this side, except we're adding width divided by 2 instead of subtracting. So after we check our rectangle, then we're going to make a larger rectangle. So we'll take the height and we'll add the gap times 2, and we'll take the width and we'll add gap times 2, and then we'll check the rectangle a second time, and now the second rectangle gets checked, and it's a little bit bigger. So this all makes sense for a rectangle that's straight up and down, but we're going to have these rectangles at an angle, and that complicates things. So that's why we're calling this rotate point, and if we look at the rotate point function, um, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to explain all of this, uh, I did try this for a couple of hours to come up with how to do this, but in the end I googled it and found an answer on Stack Overflow. And I'm going to give this some angle now. Uh, right now I've got a zero, we'll just take that out 
and make the angle equal, equals mouse X. And now if I go over here, you can see that it is affecting the rectangle. So this is the code I copied from Stack Overflow. But let's switch to this diagram for a second so I can explain a little bit about what's in that code. So we've got our regular rectangle and there's this origin X and origin Y right here. So the center of the, that rectangle where it's gonna pivot. And then we've got some point that it's checking right now. So let's call that point X and point Y. That's being sent to the function. And what we're gonna get out of the function is this, X comma Y. Uh, this same point moved, where is it gonna be after the rectangle pivots? So we have right here a distance between the center X and the point X, and we have a distance between the center Y and the point Y. And we also have the angle being sent to this function, and in this drawing, that's this angle right here. So here we're figuring X difference is the point X minus the origin X, and then the Y difference is the point Y minus the origin Y, and then we're doing some trigonometry here, I wish I could tell you how this works, but I don't know. There'll be a link to this example in the video description. So let's now go to the actual code. I won't exactly go through this in the order that things are happening because I've got some topics I want to discuss. To start this example, I've changed the angle so it's zero, so there won't be any rotation. So all it's doing is rectangle packing right now. I've also made the canvas small so it fits here and it's only doing 10,000 tries to place rectangles instead of the usual 70,000. Uh, and it, you can see it goes pretty quickly placing the rectangles. So here at the top, I've got the tries equals 10,000. There's a gap of one. There's a skip of five. Um, I'm gonna come back to the min scale. I'm using a color palette. So this is loading a JSON so here's my JSON of color palettes. There's quite a lot of them. It would have been easier to use a palette that was RGB to start with, but this is what I did. So we load the JSON file, and then I've got to turn the JSON file into an array by doing this. And then I'm able to use array functions, such as finding the length of the array. I create the canvas. I change the position of the canvas. I create a new art button and a save JPEG button. I'm telling it I want rect mode center, and then I'm calling the new art function. So then we move to the new art function. I've got a time lapse equals milliseconds. This is starting the time here, and at the very end, I end the time and print how much time it took. I clear the canvas. We come up with a resolution for the Perlin noise for the angles. And then we come up with a different Perlin noise resolution for the color. And so these are both acceptable ranges that I've found for determining the noise for the color and the noise for the angle. Next, we come up with what is the minimum and maximum width and height of the rectangles for this particular piece of art. Next, we figure out what's the color of the stroke. Is it going to be black or white or no stroke at all? There's a starting scale to the rectangles. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small, and sometimes they're in between. So this is determining that starting scale of the rectangles. I'm also adjusting that scale start based on the width of the canvas. So if you have a small canvas, that scale is going to be reduced. Then there's scale reduction. How much is it going to reduce the scale each time it does a try. If I did no scale reduction, this is what it would look like. All the rectangles would be roughly the same size. If I were to reduce the scale very quickly, then you would see only a few large rectangles and then they would quickly all become very small. I've got the scale reduction being reduced based on what the scale start is and how many tries there are. So if there's 70,000 tries, then that scale reduction is gonna be smaller. If it's 10,000 tries, then that scale reduction is gonna be a little bit larger. Now we figure out what our color palette is gonna be, and I'm getting two different color palettes. This is actually just getting a number for a color palette. It's not actually grabbing the colors just yet. And actually I'm seeing I've got scale equals scale start here. 
which makes no sense. Uh, I should just call this scale, and then I can get rid of this line. That should work. Let me just comment it out. Yeah, that still works. So we'll just get rid of that code. So next we're going to call our make background function. I'll talk about that later, I think. Uh, the noise time. So this is going to be part of the Perla noise calculation and means that we're going to get a different noise field each time we get a new piece of art. This next section, location of centers of rotation. I think we'll just hold off on that for a little bit. And all of this has to do with that bit. Finally, we're going to be trying to place our rectangle. So we've got a for loop here. And tries right now is set at 10,000. So it's going to try to place 10,000 rectangles. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to place 10,000 rectangles. It just means that's the amount of attempts that it's going to make. So we reduce the scale of the rectangle. And if we check if the rectangle has gotten to a minimum scale, so up at the top, I've got the minimum scale set to 0.2 so that the rectangles don't get so tiny that you can't see them anymore. Now we say, where are we going to attempt to place the rectangle? What's the X and the Y position? Then based on that X and Y position, what is the noise number for the rotation? And what is the noise number for the color? So we've got the X position times the resolution plus the noise time, which is uh, changing the field each time you produce a new piece of art. And then we do the same thing for the Y. And then the N2 is pretty much the same thing for the color, except we're adding 10,000 so that this field is different from this field. Then we come up with a width and a height for the rectangle. So we get a random width from the minimum width and the maximum width, and we multiply that by our current scale and we do the same thing for the height. Then we calculate the angle of rotation just for the Perlin noise. So the noise number times pi times two. And for now, let's just use Perlin noise. I've got some other angles that are calculated, but I'll go over that in a little bit. So if I hit start now, this is only Perlin noise rotation. So next we have to find out if the space is available for that particular rectangle. So first I'm gonna say, okay, right now, it's open, so that's true. And we have the first color, I'm gonna call it null. You might think, well, why do I even need to call it null? But the second time I do art, I don't want it to have the color that it had from the previous rectangle, so I wanna call that null. So then we're gonna check if the space is available for that rectangle. We're gonna check the small rectangle first, and we're checking this, which you might recognize from my example, so let's go to that check. So here's the function for check rectangle. Uh, it looks pretty much the same as it what did before. One thing that's different, this open equals false. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. But here you can see we're checking the top side of where that rectangle is gonna go. And so it's gonna call the rotate point function. So we'll go to that function next. We're at the rotate point function. We receive all this information. We make our calculations. We get our X, Y coordinate. Now we're gonna get the color off of the canvas. I don't know if I actually needed to round this for this to work properly. Let me just try X and Y without the rounding. And that appears to work just fine. So then if the first color is null, in other words, if this is the first point we're checking right now, we haven't gotten a first color yet, then make the first color equal to the color we just got. So now we have a first color that we can check all the other points against. So now let's say we're checking the second point. We get that color. Now we're gonna check. Does the color we just got equal the first color? Now, I wish I could just do if color equals first color, but it didn't seem to work. So I had to pull out the red, the green, and the blue and check each one of them. This is saying take the difference in the red between the color we just got and the first color that we got. And if that difference is less than five, then we're good. Uh, we're also going to check if the green difference is less than five and the blue difference is less than five. And so if all of that is less than five, then we're not gonna do anything. 
we're going to continue having open equal true. Otherwise, if any of these are off by five, uh, then we're going to have open equals false. So this finishes the rotation point function. So we come back from the rotate function, and then we're going to the next item. Well, here we've got if open equals false, then we're going to return. In other words, we're going to stop doing this function and go back. Because we don't want to keep doing this function, it's just going to take too long checking every point if we already know that the rectangle can't fit there. We want this function to stop at that point. So I've got that if open equals false return after each side or in the middle of checking each side. So let's say we go and we check all the points on all the sides of the rectangle. Uh, we finish doing that for the first rectangle. We come back to our new art function. We've checked the rectangle. Uh, if open equals false, we're going to continue, which means we're going to go check another rectangle. But if open equals true, then let's start checking the larger rectangle. First, we're going to increase the height and width of the rectangle by the gap. And then we're going to call the check rectangle function again. And then if open is still equal to true after all of that, then we're finally going to draw our rectangle. So we're going to push, we're going to translate to x1, y1, we're going to rotate by our angle, and then we're going to get a color. Um, I think I'll talk about color in a little while. There's also a check here to make sure that the rectangle color that I'm placing down is not the same color as the color that's already on the canvas. So this is a while loop, and as long as the color is the same, then we're going to get a new color. So we're going to fill with color that we come up with. And finally, we're going to draw our rectangle. Took a while, didn't it? Uh, and we're going to put that at 0, 0 because we've translated to this position. We'll make it the width and the height. And then we're going to pop. So that's one rectangle attempted to be drawn. And now we can go attempt to put another rectangle down. When we get through all our rectangle attempts, this is where I'm printing how many seconds it took to do all of this. So the current milliseconds that are elapsed minus the time lapse that we set earlier in the code. I'm going to wrap up this video here because it was getting long, but this gives you the majority of what's going on in the code. In part two, I'll talk about the second way I rotate the rectangles and I'll go into the color in more detail. If you've liked this video, please give it a like, consider subscribing to the channel, ring the bell for notifications, comments are welcome, I love to read your comments. Thank you for watching, I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. Steve's Makerspace.